I was just remarking, looking over Fred's curriculum vita, that he started research the year I was born. <laughs> Between us, our careers span, my lifetime and his career, span a very revolutionary period in anthropology and in archaeology. Every once in a while, such a period occurs in the course of a, a discipline history, and it's the privilege of certain scholars who live at that time to help to shape the course of their discipline for future generations. Fred picked up the challenge of this time and has served in such a role. He is truly one of our founding fathers in many senses of that word. He specialized in southwestern archaeology after graduation from the University of Arizona in 1948. Went on to Harvard for his MA and PhD. He became interested in public archaeology. This is what we call it today. They call it salvage archaeology. This is the interface between government, industry, and archaeology. We shape the land, and as we shape the land, we destroy the heritage of the peoples who lived on this continent for thousands of years before we arrived. In the course of this destruction, some information had to be salvaged. Fred was one of the people who recognized the need for some coherent and consistent policy governing how we might go about saving our heritage and at the same time carry out the changes of the landscape which we need to carry out. Well, today, public archaeology is a multi-million dollar enterprise involving archaeologists all over this country. Fred helped shape the, uh, the code and still helps to shape the code and conduct this kind of archaeology in the United States as it becomes more and more important to our discipline. He went to North Africa as a Paleo-Indian expert, as a Paleolithic expert, as a salvage archaeology expert, and helped initiate an enormous project on the prehistory of North Africa, and particularly the Nile River Valley. In the course of that research, which is ongoing to this day, he has made innumerable discoveries of great importance to us in understanding the evolution of our species, in understanding the evolution of different kinds of society, from hunter-gatherers, going towards village farmers, and ultimately to civilizations. He took up this challenge and in the course of it, he has written innumerable books and articles on the research that he carries out there. I believe he is going to speak to us today about some of this research. He is also the founding father of this department of anthropology. He came here in 1964, and since 1968 was the chairman of this department. He shaped it. I'm here because he is here. All of us are here because he was here. He had the vision and the courage and the sweet persuasion <laughs> to make this department what it is, one of the outstanding departments of anthropology in the country. Fred's recent research has involved major breakthroughs in our understanding of how domestication of plants and animals, a sedentary life, ultimately led to the kinds of civilizations which we have today in the world. I believe I will let him speak about those instead of introducing him any further. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. <coughs> I think it's going to be very difficult to follow that. <laughs> I better get my chain here a little bit longer because when I wander around over the landscape, I'll find myself tethered to a, a collapsing piece of electronic equipment. I want to talk a little bit today about the beginnings of culture and society and its evolution to what we live in today. I will stop short of the civilization, but I'll try to take us from the very simple, primitive steps 
up to the more complex things that we see on the horizon just before uh, the beginnings of civilization. I have to comment by saying we don't know what caused it. I'm sure that uh, Dr. Sampson left you with the view that, that we don't know why or when man really began this thing we call culture, when he began to use tools. We have some thoughts and some ideas, but we really don't understand what was the thing that triggered it. We know that it has had a profound impact on our lives and on the way we do things. We've had a profound impact upon, upon the entire universe and on the entire world that we live in. The first simple primitive beginnings of, of this step were those <coughs> crude chopping tools that he told us about last time. Now, we don't know when that really first began. More than two million years ago, perhaps as early as nearly four million years ago, those first primitive tools. Then by around somewhere between a million and a half and one million years ago, we had another profound change that occurred in the way that people were making their tools. And this was the beginning of the hand axes, the Acheulean tradition, that it was also a major landmark in the development of our cultures. The, again, we do not know why they shifted from making these simple pebble tools or why it took them so long. After all, it may well have taken them over two million years to have evolved from those simple little stones with, with flaked edges on them to a more complex stone. <laughs> uh, these are the real McCoy. And it's uh, one of the advantages that uh, we have of being able to work in Africa a few years ago that we have such a large collection here at SMU of these, of these rocks. As a matter of fact, it looked for a long time as if every rock in Africa was going to end up here in Dallas. <laughs> and uh, uh, we're no longer quite as greedy. But this set of rocks over here are what we're calling Acheulean, that is, the bifaces, the hand axes, that you've probably read a lot about. And we don't really know that they were axes. In fact, I'm sure they're not axes in the sense of digging or, or cutting holes in wood or cutting down trees, although they might have. They were probably the... Uh, the original Boy Scout knife, the, uh, the original multipurpose tool that did everything. Um, most of them that I have looked at that under a microscope to check and see where the wear has occurred, you'll find that the wear and the polish from, from their use, whatever use was done, is along one edge of the, of the hand axe, as if it was used in, in a system like this, so that they were cutting along. I don't want to cut this, <laughs> this uh, stuff, but uh, uh, that's the... Uh, most of the ones that I have handled and looked at under a microscope for wear, they were used in that way rather than in the method that um, most of us uh, would tend to think of them when they were used there. These tools, this particular kind of thing, came into use, uh, say, somewhere between a million and a half and a million years ago, and with very little change, so little change that I have a very difficult time, uh, you know, uh, recognizing it or identifying with it, uh, very little change for... Uh, until maybe 200,000 years ago. Virtually no change. So there was a, a long period of perhaps a million years or more when this style of tools were the prevailing things all we had. That's not quite true. They did have some other things. They had uh, uh, scrapers, very simple primitive scrapers. Uh, they had, uh, some of them are not really pointed. Some of them are, are round in shape. Um, they. Uh, <coughs> Some of them are oval, uh, some of them are small, some of them are large, but throughout that time period you get all of those things. And the, really the only way that you can distinguish the early part of that from the end part of it is towards the end they were making them nicer, some of them. So that in a collection of say a thousand of them that you might find in one spot, um, you can look and find in, the, in this particular area uh, a some of the individual pieces will be better made and more regularized and, and the edges of them will be more even and therefore you can say, well, this is more near the end of it and is what we usually call upper Acheulean as a versus lower Acheulean. They did have a, you know, the usual uh, mother bear, papa bear and baby bear of lower, middle and upper, but uh, we've gotten away from that now because the archaeologists have finally come to realize that we cannot really distinguish the middle from either the lower or the upper. So we have no now only lower Acheulean and upper Acheulean, and it happens that all of those 
are from the upper Acheulean in that particular set on the table. But uh, uh, if we had, for example, uh, most of them here could well have gone into a, a lower Acheulean assemblage um, as being unregularized, uh, but, um, and certainly that one could have gone, but um, they're, they're not really, uh, they're, not, they're not the true Mackay because in every assemblage in which those come from, there were also those very nice regularized pieces that... Uh, now the people at this time were somewhat better informed of, and I can uh, talk a little bit more about that a little later. I have some slides of, of um, one or two of the, uh, one or two views of one of their individuals involved in this time period. Um, it seems that about the time the hand axes came into play, we had a new kind of, of man appear. Now, we can't really say that it's, there's a coincidence. The new kind of man and the new kind of tools appeared. Uh, it would be ideal if we could do it that way, but it just happens that every time we find this new kind of tool, we also find this new kind of man. Uh, so I'm fairly sure they go closely together, if not one for one. This new kind of man is the thing that most of us have heard of in, back uh, in the last century when Dubois found the, the, uh, the ancient uh, skulls that were called the Java man. And in the more uh, learned terms are called Pithecanthropus. Uh, today is called the Homo erectus. And this is the uh, uh, form that by the name Homo in front of it means it's man against that uh, funny little ape that walked around and threw sticks uh, that we call Australopithecus. But this is a, a man, but he, and he walked upright, uh, but he's a very primitive man. He would not really do well in a bar fight. Uh, he, was, uh, he would have an unfair advantage, I think, over the rest of us. And uh, uh, even, I'm sure, that he would not do well for, uh, uh, he wouldn't sit in even on the, on the football team. He'd be a little bit too too rugged in appearance. These, uh, <coughs> these people uh, hunted animals. They, um, we can say pretty surely they hunted animals because I'll show you some pictures of some of the animals that they were hunting, as we have found in Ethiopia. Um, uh, that is, we here at SMU and other people in all over, in many other parts of Africa and in, in uh, other areas, have found uh, animals that were killed and butchered by a Shulian man. And they have left behind, in amongst the animal remains, uh, these knives and the uh, hand axes and the other pieces of stone that were used in the butchering process uh, and in utilizing that animal. They were hunting a large, they were, I think, uh, may well have been uh, effective hunters, although we really can't judge how much is hunting and how much is scavenging. This is, this is beyond us. Uh, I suspect that it was sometimes hunting and sometimes scavenging. One of the events that happened during this period that we have pretty good control of, that is, we know it happened during this, these uh, million years, we don't know when it happened, but we know it happened, was that they began to use fire. Fire makes its first appearance during the Acheulean. That is, our evidence for fire makes its first appearance during this time. We don't know when. It's in the latest, the earliest that we have any real good evidence for is in the late Acheulean. Now, the Acheulean is, uh, is supplanted. And it, it is supplanted, and it, it's like what happened at the end of the older one of the chopping tools. It's supplanted almost as if somebody ran down the window shade. And suddenly, every place, they drop the hand axes. Of course, it didn't happen this way. We know it didn't happen this way. But it's what it looks like to us from our perspective of this, of this uh, of the panor panorama there. But they put down the hand axes, and they picked up a new technology. Now, the new you could see signs, actually, that the new technology was being developed in the final part of the Acheulean. You can see signs that the, this new technology is using tools in which they're made primarily instead of, uh, as these are, these are made primarily on cores. That is, they took a big piece of rock 
and knock flakes off of this to shape it. It's, a, it's what we refer to then as a, a core tool. Now the, the next step, what they're after is, a, is not the core tool, but they're wanting those flakes that came off of something like that. They're wanting a flake tool, and they have developed in the process of learning how to shape those hand axes. They have learned how to take the core, here's a core, they've learned how to take the core, shape it in a way so that when they hit it again at one end, they could knock off a flake which gave, which was its shape, its final shape was predetermined. If you will notice this, as I hold it up here, and you, I'm sure that you can see, at least the front rows can see it, there's a, there is a big flake taken out of this core, and you can see it was a big pointed flake. Can you see the flake scars back there? Well, now this is a, we have a fancy term for it, but uh, this is the, the core, and what they were taking off are things like this, you see, and this is what they used. This is the use piece. And we have, I have a batch of these up here, which you can see. Along with this, they also had uh, more complex scrapers, like this one, a lot more uh, uh, better made, uh, more regular on the edges. Uh, they had uh, a few other uh, specialized tools, but all made on flakes, all made on flakes. So they shifted from uh, uh, using the, the center part as the tool that they wanted to using the pieces that previously had been knocked off as the tools they wanted. And for some reason, which I'm not really uh, going to go into today, this is a more efficient way of using the raw material. Now, uh, both these kinds of sites, these, kind, these time periods, have lots of, of artifacts in them, as you'll see on one of the slides that I'll show you. Uh, you can go to an Acheulean site, and uh, it's a, you can pick up a thousand hand axes without any trouble at all. Um, we dug a, a spring vent that was about uh, this big around, uh, about six feet diameter, and uh, about uh, six, seven feet deep. And I got a thousand hand axes out of it. It was stuffed with hand axes out of a spring vent. Now the same phenomenon, what I'm really saying here is that these things are, didn't have the kind of uh, value associated to them that you and I look to them. Uh, it, you know, I've discovered that museum folks think the hand axes are of great value because they're something they can display. Um, obviously, the Acheulean people really didn't have that view because uh, they just threw them away. They used them a little while and dropped them into wherever, you know, whatever place that would get them out of the way. Otherwise, you wouldn't find so many of them. They'd have two or three of them which they'd curate and save and carry around. The same thing was true in this time period in here, which is the beginnings of the Middle Paleolithic. Now, the beginnings of the Middle Paleolithic, when these, these things occur, and we, we see this happening, and we'll get in a debate about this if I talk about the ages, but I'm going to tell you when I think it happened. I think it happened about 200,000 years ago. And at about this time, or actually at the end of this period over here, we begin to get what we call modern man, homo sapiens. Now, he is not the same kind of sapiens that walks down the street, um, but he's anatomically a modern man. He's not in a different species, although for many years they did consider these primitive modern men as in a different species, but a subspecies or a race really different from today. And the one that you've heard most about that's in this category here, the Middle Paleolithic, are the ones that they call the Neanderthals. Somewhere in our background, we've all got Neanderthals. Uh, as much as it, uh, you know, it uh, displeases us when you see these uh, uh, pictures of these uh, primitive-looking uh, creatures, uh, they would just about make a football team. <laughs> <laughs> They're really quite rugged. Uh, low sloping uh, foreheads, uh, musculature was, was very highly developed. <coughs> in, the, in the late Acheulean, we get uh, the first signs of another change that is going to carry on into the Middle Paleolithic, and that is that people began to use caves extensively. Now there are occasional caves, maybe, being used 
in the Odawan in the chopping tool period. But caves, for some reason, were not, maybe they couldn't handle the cave bears. You know, that's a real possibility. I made it as sort of a, as a, a light comment. But it may well be true that they simply couldn't get in the caves because the cave bears wouldn't let them in. Uh, it takes a, but at any rate, by the end of the late Acheulean, we do have uh, half a dozen or so caves that clearly were being occupied at that time. But in the middle Paleolithic, they've got it made. They can beat the bears, there's no doubt about it, because they're in there quite numerous all over Europe. Uh, in fact, almost any place that we find middle Paleolithic man, we find at that time they were using caves as a place to live in. I'm sure throughout all this time, <coughs> social groups must have been very small. We really do not have a handle on the sizes of the social groups, their complexity, how they were organized, whether they were families or not. We really do not know uh, if they had the kind of universal that we think of today as the nuclear family of mama and papa and the children. Uh, I suspect that they did have, but we do not have really good archaeological evidence that these, these particular types of social phenomena actually existed. I, <coughs> I dug a site in, um, um, in, in Arizona, in um, uh, Egypt one time, uh, which uh, suggested to me that it actually was a, a family unit. That is, there was, a, there was a little small cluster of artifacts and another little small cluster of nearby, both of which looked like they were very small periods of occupation. And then, um, and I was all set to argue that um, this may well be uh, uh, two family units see, camping together for a period of time, and uh, then moving on. And of course, when carbon-14 dating first began, uh, and there were many uh, carbon-14 samples for uh, middle Paleolithic materials were submitted to uh, radiocarbon laboratories, and we got uh, a number of dates, uh, which were, in the, some of the dates in the early years would be 35,000 years ago, or greater than 40,000 years ago, or um, greater than 50,000 years ago. And <coughs> it kind of got into our, our thinking that um, the Middle Paleolithic was somewhere, you know, about 50, 60,000 years ago, and uh, continued up until maybe 30,000 years ago. Well, uh, one of the Middle Paleolithic sites that we, we dug in, in uh, Ethiopia uh, had layers of volcanic ash in it. There were uh, numerous layers. In fact, uh, it seems that every time they would go away, or maybe they left because of it, there'd be a layer of volcanic ash come in and cover over their site. It was right on the slopes of a volcano, and so every time it belts, you know, it would throw out all of this stuff and cover their settlements, and then they would come back. And, and this, in fact, this was a site which was, had about uh, 25 feet of accumulation of, uh, of uh, cultural debris interspersed with, uh, with lenses of volcanic ash. At the very bottom of this uh, sequence was uh, one of these um, um, Acheulean, late final Acheulean uh, hand axe levels with uh, material there. And then on top of that was a, unfortunately we couldn't date the ash that was right on top of that. We didn't, didn't get the right chemical constituencies in that. But then on top of that was uh, uh, one of these early Middle Paleolithic sites. And then right on top of that was a volcanic ash. And then more layers of this going on up for those 25 feet. Well, um, you know what we got. We took some of that and took it to the laboratories that could date with potassium argon. And uh, so the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the, just the one just above the lowest of the Middle Paleolithic, gave us a date of 210,000 years ago. The one about uh, <coughs> uh, halfway up uh, gave us a date of 180,000 years ago, and the one at the top gave us a date of 140,000 years ago. Well, obviously that's a lot older than most of us had been thinking about. We published it with saying, well, here's the inf information, here's the evidence. 
and I think everybody has pre pretended it didn't exist ever since. Uh, the, uh, there is a problem. Uh, those three dates, which we have, I went back to Ethiopia four or five years ago and recollected that series of samples and made some more s dates, and they all came out about in the same range. Uh, that is, we collected several other layers. But um, um, the problem is that along the ocean, in the beaches, there are middle Paleolithic artifacts associated with high beach levels that are believed to record the period when the oceans were much higher than today, when almost all the glacial ice had melted at the poles and the beaches were, were uh, uh, quite a bit uh, higher level, about 20, 25 meters above their present level. And um, uh, associated with those are middle Paleolithic artifacts like these. And uh, analysis of shells using another one of these uh, the new physical chemical uh, radiometric dating techniques has indicated that those things are only about 90,000 to 110,000 years old and maybe even 70,000 years old. And we have a real problem. We have a confrontation, between, and there are lots of those dates, by the way, you know, maybe, maybe 75 or 100 of those dates all over the world. And uh, so I have a, a real problem there. Either my system of dating, not mine, but the one that was used for this system is wrong, or the one that they're using for those shells is wrong. Um, I like mine because it's the one I got, but uh, uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't really, you know, really don't care too much one way or the other. The, um, uh, we find, though, that in addition to people living in caves, that they are certainly by this time much more efficient in their hunting techniques in the, uh, and in the killing of animals. Uh, they're, they have uh, exploited more of the world's surface. They have been able, because they now have fire, they have moved well on up into northern Europe. They have been able to occupy Europe even at a time when the glaciers were advancing south uh, and covering over much of what is now central Germany and, in fact, all much of northern Europe and England and that, and that part of, the, uh, of, uh, of Europe. So that the area was occupied was uh, much more expanded from that which we find in, in earlier times. This, um, this period comes to an end, uh, again, uh, maybe about 40,000 years ago, with the appearance of what's called the Late Paleolithic. And in this instance, there is a new technological development which occurs that um, uh, we've, I can guess, illustrated here. Uh, they have s started making these flakes that they knocked off before. They're making them long and, s and very long and narrow, like this. These, uh, in fact, this is a more efficient way of using the raw material, and therefore more efficient. The efficient drives out the inefficient, and it spread like wildfire all over the world, so much so that we cannot see where it started and how it spread. We just know that very rapidly, this new way of using the raw material and making these kinds of, of stone tools appears and replaces the flake stone complexes which we had previously of the Middle Paleolithic. Now, in, it, it is more efficient in that they can make a lot more of these things that are the blanks that they use for the tools. And they, they make these blanks, they take the blanks, and then they can make scrapers on, on them. They can uh, take one edge and blunt it and then use the other edge for a knife, holding it in some sort of a, of a stick. They can, uh, they can take the end and, and shape it to what we call a burin, which is nothing but a, a kind of a graving tool. Uh, they, they can, this is the multipurpose blank from which all of the, a very complex tool kit was made. And I've got here two, a few of those. We've got some, some perforators, some back pieces, and scrapers, and things of that sort. And with this new appearance, and one other thing before I leave the Middle Paleolithic, I should mention. The first real signs of religion is evident during the Middle Paleolithic. Now, uh, the first manifestations of this are things which we call uh, uh, altars. I'm not sure they are, but we find skulls of bears in the caves set up on altars, which suggests that uh, 
that those bears were also <laughs> were still kind of um, interesting things to take on when you had to root them out of the cave so you could live in it. At any, at any event, uh, the bear cult uh, was quite important to them, and uh, so they, uh, and it was reflected in religious practices. Now, in the middle Pal uh, when the end of the Middle Paleolithic and the beginning of the, of the Late Paleolithic or Upper Paleolithic, we have, again, a change in physical type. Now, uh, let me emphasize again, it's not just one to one because sometimes back in the middle Paleolithic, we get uh, modern man, Homo sapiens sapiens. There are some of those. Uh, primitive modern man, but modern man. But by the time we have the, l the upper Paleolithic or the late Paleolithic, uh, it is all modern man. Everywhere it is modern man. And this transfer occurs, and of course by now, which is around 40,000 years ago, our chronological controls are getting much more precise. Uh, we can see we can have a little bit better handle on what's going on. Now, from the, all of this time, I've been talking about uh, stone tools, and I'm going to need to uh, continue to do it this way. Uh, but I want to say that at the end of the late, of the late Stone Age, before it was over, um, sometime around 15,000 years ago, 18,000 years ago, another change occurs in the, in the technology which uh, is also more efficient in that they <coughs> discovered that, that, they didn't, that they didn't need to use just this as a tool, this blade, this piece, long, narrow piece of stone as a tool, as by retouching it and making it into a variety of things that they could take it and break it into various pieces and shape it into complex uh, compound tools. As they could take these and shape them into little pieces like this, which I'm holding my hand, one of these, and they could take um, and say three or four of these of various shapes and combine them and use them as barbs, use them as projectile points, use them in varieties of ways. Uh, but in other words, the, the tools then are no longer single, single stones, single pieces, but are made up of a mo many elements in which they are shaped individually. And this phenomena also uh, uh, caught on like wildfire. We cannot see where it began. Um, but it spread all over the old world, all over Africa, all over Asia. Uh, it got into the new world uh, right at the end. but after people that were already here, so that it didn't get into the New World until maybe um, what we call the early Holocene, the beginning of this time frame, about oh, maybe 7,000 years ago, uh, we began to get this same thing of the geometrics up in Alaska, these little compound tools occurring in Alaska. And of course, by this time, we're, uh, people are all like, uh, uh, like this audience. That is, we're, we're truly uh, modern men. Uh, no, no signs of the, any of the more primitive or uh, uh, ancestral forms of uh, physical type. The, um, during this late Paleolithic, however, there was a, a very interesting phenomena occurred, which was most important in the development of our, of our um, later cultural and social developments. This was the beginning of food production. <coughs> um, traditional thought in all of the textbooks, and I would say that most archaeologists today will tell you that um, food production began first time in the Near East, in somewhere in what's now the Levant, and uh, because they believe that the wild cereals that were first domesticated, wheat and barley, were growing in that area as wild plants, and a man began to utilize them first, and then uh, gradually through time, not very much time, he began to uh, uh, modify them so that he could use them more uh, effectively. And this produced, these changes produced the gradual changes produced what we now see 
as food production, that is, growing crops, farming. And at about the same time, or slightly later, they began to fiddle with the animals, and that we had the first domestication of sheep and goat and cattle. Well, <clears throat> I hate to disappoint my colleagues who've had this thought now since uh, World War II, uh, but, uh, uh, and, and I also will have to tell you that my, my Ku Klux Klan ancestors are going to roll over <laughs> in, uh, in annoyance at this, but I'm afraid it began in Africa. <laughs> my, my evidence for this is, um, is uh, goes back to about uh, the end period of uh, the work we were doing in the Aswan Reservoir in the late mid-1960s. We began to find grinding stones in sites that were late Paleolithic and with radiocarbon ages of about 14,000, 15,000 years ago. And uh, now there are many things that grinding stones could be used for besides grinding up cereals. They can be used for pounding meat. They can be used for pounding up paint. Um, anything that you want to grind can be ground on a grinding stone, of course. Um, but it bothered me that we were getting dozens of these grinding stones. You know, not just one, but a whole batch of them. And uh, s while many of them did have paint on them, it, uh, they showed an enormous amount of wear, which made it very difficult for me to believe that, you know, they'd paint every African for a thousand miles around there with uh, the pigment that was on the, the grinding stones from one that, uh, for the wear on one of those grinding stones. Well, we searched and searched to try to find some of the grains that might have been used. We believe these would be truly cereals. Uh, in fact, we did some of the sediments and had them analyzed, and some of the deposits uh, yielded uh, pollen that was identified as barley. Other sediments in, in yielded uh, 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 spores of, of a rust that lives on wheat. <coughs> but uh, that was really not sufficient evidence for most of my colleagues, or for us. And then in 1978, two years ago, we uh, were excavating at a place near Aswan in Egypt, and uh, at a site which, a series of sites, which date, uh, we have a numerous, we have eight radiocarbon dates on the sites, ranging between 18,200 and 17,300 years ago. And the, uh, in those sites, we found um, grains of wheat, einkorn wheat, and barley. They um, uh, were charred grains that had been roasted. Uh, einkorn wheat does not grow in, uh, in Egypt. It has never been known for an archaeological context in Egypt. And the barley is a rather primitive form. Uh, associated with those cereals were numerous grinding stones. And uh, uh, so it, now the issue is, were the cereals wild and just being exploited, or were the cereals uh, already a domesticate? The discovery of this, uh, these cereals poses us a, a real, real difficult question. If they are domesticates, it means that the food product, because I can tell you that in the Levant and elsewhere in the Near East at this time, they were still painting themselves blue and chasing rabbits. They were not farming. Uh, the, um, uh, it, um, if it's domesticated, it means that uh, food production began many thousands of years earlier than we had previously believed. In fact, I'm certain that if these are domestic grains, um, this is not the oldest occurrence of, those, of that domestication, even though it's at a very early stage. There had to have been hundreds, perhaps thousands of years, which preceded that. The, <coughs> the beginnings of, uh, of this uh, uh, food production, therefore, might well be uh, more than 20,000 years ago. Now, if they're wild, it poses yet another problem. Uh, wild cereals at Aswan would mean that they had to live in only from the floodwaters of the Nile. There was no rainfall during this period. There's no signs that the 
that it was, it was drier than it is now in Egypt. And <coughs> it would mean that they were living only from the floodwaters, the moisture that comes from the Nile. From Aswan south to Ethiopia, there is no barrier which would inhibit wild cereals from going all the way over in East Africa. Well, if wild cereals got there, they could have been all over and would have been all over Africa. And we have no signs, no traces of wild cereals, wheats and barleys, anywhere in East Africa. So no matter which way we go in interpreting this, it's, uh, it poses serious problems for, for the biologists and for the archaeologists. I will comment, though, that if they're domestic, which I really think there is, and there is, I should indicate, some biological, botanical evidence uh, that suggests that they already are domestic that uh, if they are domestic, it means that not only did food production begin several thousand years earlier than we thought, it means that it began somewhere else than, than we've been traditionally looking for it, probably somewhere in Africa. It means that it went on for many thousands of years without any change whatever in the sizes of the social groups or the way they were organized uh, or their sedentism. It, it means that, that there was no automatic uh, shift from hunting and wi wandering around or whatever kind of uh, uh, exploitive pattern that the uh, uh, Paleolithic man had to the village life which we see as the hallmark in the beginnings of the, of the food producing era of the, middle, middle, of the uh, Neolithic. Since we, we don't really know whether first tools are two million or four million years old. If we took and said it's going to be 3.6 3 million years, which doesn't sound very long ago, 3.6 million years ago when we first recognized rocks that we can identify as tools and we transpose that on this yardstick, we can see that 36 inches represents the total span of time from today to back when the first of those very primitive chopping tools that uh, Dr. Sampson showed you last time were first introduced. First ones. <coughs> this is uh, the Horn of East Africa and the Great Rift Valley, which it happens, I don't know necessarily that uh, all of this invention and the human changes in the beginning and so on occurs in East Africa, but ma the majority of the evidence that we have is, is in this area and part of the reason is because of this Rift Valley and the volcanism and volcanic ashes and lakes and so on that we have there uh, going back to the uh, uh, very end of the Pliocene, the very beginning of the, of the Pleistocene, our modern age, uh, which are present and preserved here. And because of these sediments in this whole rift here are so good, the fossil are so good, and because we have these so many volcanic ashes and lava flows in there, uh, we're able, it's, it's a happy hunting ground for archaeologists. Now the area that I'm, uh, I'm interested in and, and uh, we'll be talking about are two. The first one will be right up in here in the Donakil Depression, right, right here is the Donakil Depression in the Awash, the upper Awash Valley where, um, in middle Awash Valley where uh, we worked uh, uh, 1975 and 76. And then uh, down here in this area here, uh, there's a big lake called Lake Zwei, uh, <coughs> just south of Addis Ababa, uh, where we worked in 1972 and 73, um, and which um, the one up in here in the Donakil, which is a uh, real hairy field, field area, I might tell you, uh, was um, we were looking at uh, Acheulean. Uh, we were actually trying to find some old Avon, never found any, but we did find lots of Acheulean, and um, including some human, fossil human remains. And down in here, we were working in middle Paleolithic uh, occupations. May I have the next slide, please? This <coughs> give you a little bit better picture. Here's uh, Addis, Addis right here. Here we are. And the Lake Zwei area is right here. And then we're up in, in here in, the, in the, uh, this region here of the Awash. Um, it's, it's an area which um, is very much like a uh, this area particularly, the Donahue, is very much like Arizona was in 1864, I guess, where there were 
cowboys and Indians, and everybody carries a rifle and uses it whenever possible. Um, next one, please. I was, uh, but I'll tell you, the archaeology was worth it. <laughs> the, <laughs> this is one of those. These are lake sediments. These are <coughs> middle Pleistocene lake sediments, filled with Hesulian, and filled with butchered animals, and filled with uh, fossil human remains. Uh, there are uh, at least 25 within within about five miles of, of this particular spot. There are 25 butchered animals of, with Acheulean hand axes and Acheulean artifacts associated with them. It's the world's largest concentration of preserved Acheulean material, as far as I know. Next one, please. And one of the uh, interesting things in there are those hard layers that you can see here. Those are volcanic ash, which is um, uh, the thing that gets all of our attention for being able to uh, get some absolute dating on the discoveries. Uh, these, by the way, are artifacts which have washed out from Lord knows where uh, from someplace in the deposit. Uh, but um, <coughs> there are numerous artifacts scattered on the surface. Next one, please. I'll show you. Next one, please. And um, uh, so that the remains are in superb condition. It is a wonderful middle Pleistocene uh, hunting ground. Unfortunately, it's um, an area where there's some contest today, and um, uh, so it's difficult to work there right now. We had planned on going there this, uh, uh, this Christmas and still may go next year uh, if they can get their uh, fun and games straightened out. Next one, please. <coughs> oh, I must have gotten that one in. Well, at any rate, these are, uh, see the, uh, that's some uh, primate there, I believe. I'm not sure what it is, grill, something like that. And uh, there's a flake artifact, uh, some sort of a uh, piece right here, embedded uh, right next to the, to the uh, skull of that, that creature. And this is a big knuckle bone of something like an, uh, not sure what that animal is there. I've forgotten, truthfully. Next one, please. But you can see that uh, the, the lyre, uh, like horns for some, some big antelope, this is a huge one, also washed out of these deposits. Uh, really didn't have a chance to do major excavations there. Uh, it's <coughs> the Afar are not known for working in laborers. Uh, they are more cattle herders and, and, uh, and uh, warriors. And so all of the digging had to be done by us. <coughs> Next one, please. Um, I thought you might be interested in seeing this picture. Every one of these is a hand axe. A hand axe. Every one of them. <laughs> Without exception. <laughs> well, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and they're coming out somewhere around in here, coming, coming right out of this spot. You can see what I meant by thousands of them. Why they, I cannot believe that they were very uh, impressed by hand axes. And I could actually depress the market. Uh, <laughs> I am certain that if the Ethiopians would let me take that collection home, <laughs> uh, I would forevermore. Uh, well, I think Dr. Hiroi would ban me from entering the building, for one thing. It, the, wherever I set them, the whole building would settle there. <coughs> Next one, please. Another, uh, this is fossil bone, by the way, and this is a, a big um, flake scar off of a, a giant boulder that was used as a core, and uh, these big flakes like this were then taken and made into, into into hand axes. <coughs> Next one, please. Now, uh, this is the locale of one of our very interesting discoveries there in, in, the, uh, in the Awash. Uh, right here, where this uh, little white material is where we found, I believe, the next slide. 
Um, <clears throat> this is a uh, Homo erectus, a very late form of Homo erectus, maybe going into a Homo sapiens uh, Neanderthal-like thing. Uh, it's, uh, it was found there in that particular spot, and it's a, very interesting because it's the facial parts is, is uh, unusually well preserved. Um, we also have the rest of the skull vault and got it together. Um, one of the things that's happened with in Ethiopia is that they have um, uh, become very concerned about their patrimony and their historical heritage and they allowed us to make a cast of the uh, skull and the face and they wouldn't allow, and uh, so that the mold and the original are both in Ethiopia, and and uh, we've not really been able to complete the uh, uh, the study of the of the human remains. This is because of some unfortunate experience they had uh, with another uh, no um, uh, fossil hunter in. Um, and getting their materials recovered and returned to them. And so they've uh, just making it very difficult to, uh, to uh, that's what happens when, by the way, when you're working in these areas and somebody abuses their, their generosity or their good offices, well, they frequently on everybody to everyone's uh, detriment. <coughs> Next one, please. Now, this one goes down south into the Middle Paleolithic and uh, it is this series of, of deposits that go on up through here that we're talking about in, in, the, um, uh, in the Lake Zwei area with Middle Stone Age. At the very bottom was uh, Acheulean hand axes and at the top were uh, late Middle Pale. Next one, please. And it's in this sequence that we get uh, uh, those series of dates which range from uh, around a little earlier than 200,000 at the bottom and uh, 140,000 at the top. Uh, we're here clearing uh, three separate occupation layers. There's a volcanic ash layer here, so you can just see the little white streaks. And then there's yet another uppermost uh, occupation layer right there. Next one, please. Here, <coughs> all these projects, he's pointing to one of the occupation horizons. There's another one right here where this uh, this uh, layer. <clears throat> you can see uh, the volcanic ash here in little clumps of volcanic ash. In many places it occurs as a solid bed and in other areas it's been altered by soil process so that you only have uh, clumps of uh, ash left. Next one please. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll move on quickly because I know I've taken too much time to Egypt and uh, uh, the areas I'm going to be talking about here are mostly in the desert. Um, but uh, because one of the spots is out here at Dakla Oasis, the first spot, and then out here at Bir Sahara. Uh, by the way, I should tell you, and for those of you who haven't uh, heard me talk about some of this stuff before, these little dots out in here are where somebody has driven before. Um, they're not really roads, and if you're going out in the Sahara, don't believe it. But the first uh, this is at Dakla, and this is an Ashulian spring vent. Um, these are, are uh, the deflated remnants, actually the bottom of a spring vent. The spring probably stood another five or six meters higher when it was flowing uh, and the landscape has subsequently been eroded down. Actually from back here where I was standing, uh, this is not a really good picture for you to get a glimpse of the landscape. Behind where I was standing when I took this picture, there's a little bluff which stands up about uh, five, six meters higher. Uh, that is the remnant of the original landscape when these, uh, this was an active spring. <coughs> Next one, please. And on the surface of this spring vent are hand axes, as you can see. Here's another one. Uh, just very fresh and just eroding out of the, of the center of that little mound. Next one, please. After we excavated that, we've got a thousand of these hand axes out of this. Uh, and here are uh, some of them. We have boxes and boxes and bags of the things. Um, this is, by the way, many of you recognize our old friend, Dr. Roman Shield, who's been is a Polish Academy of Sciences and has been here as a visiting professor on two occasions here at SMU. <coughs> but uh, as you can see, some of these are very crude and primitive. 
and some of them are really well made, very well regularized, and very even on the sides. And for this reason, this is regarded by uh, those of us who studied them in some detail to be a, a late, almost final Acheulean, very end of the Acheulean. Next one, please. <coughs> Here we go south to Bir Sahara, and uh, this is the garden spot of the Sahara. <laughs> this is our camp, by the way. Uh, <coughs> and around the edges of this were numerous exposures of, of uh, lake deposits once this whole area and around the shores of the lake were many Middle Paleolithic camping sites. Next one, please. <coughs> here is that basin looking slightly a little different direction, and here is some of the remnants of the lake deposits, and around in several different places we'll find campsites of Middle Paleolithic man. Next one, please. Here's one of them, and these are all artifacts here uh, spewing out from this campsite right here. Uh, that's uh, exposed just below these white uh, lacustrine mud, mud uh, limestones. Next one, please. Now that show that there was a, a Middle Paleolithic camp right here on what was the shore of the lake. Uh, I have a fluctuating. Sometimes it was bigger and then it went down, covered over. In this instance, it had been larger here, and then it receded, and then and the people were camping there, and then it got larger again, and there it is. In fact, a very complex situation. Next one, please. <clears throat> also around in the lake basin were exposures of, of uh, animal remains uh, where they had butchered uh, many of these uh, uh, animals. And somewhere in here there are two or three artifacts, I'm not sure I can put my finger right on them, uh, <clears throat> that were embedded in, the, in these bone scatters. These are mostly uh, 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 giant camels and a big antelope and uh, um, uh, and a uh, rhinoceros were the animal remains that we found most intensively hunted uh, during this period in the Middle Paleolithic in the Sahara. Next one, please. Now, <coughs> jumping on ahead uh, from uh, you know this point on the, my stick down to two tenths or about one tenth of of the end, we find. Uh, a very different kind of settlement and exploitive pattern in the Sahara is represented. We have, uh, beginning at about 8,000 to 9,000 years ago in the Sahara, we find uh, the beginnings of villages. And here is a house outline of one of the earliest of those villages. This is a, a, a some sort of a grass house. There were some post holes around these things. and. Uh, they had associated with them right in front of each one of them. Here is this one, by the way. It was a storage pit, a bell-shaped, deep bell-shaped storage pit where they could store their, their uh, grains and their commodities. And then a little beyond that was a well. Which was These houses were arranged not just helter-skelter over the landscape, but were arranged in long parallel rows, two rows of them, so that they tell us that by this time, certainly, we have an organized social structure and some social discipline. Next one, please. And <clears throat> here you, you can't really quite see this as well as I'd hoped when I got this slide out, but there is, uh, we, because we've cut all these things up in very different ways to try to see them, but here is one of those house floors coming in right here. Here's the storage pit. There's another row of them. And this, this row goes on off this way, and this row of them goes on off this way. <clears throat> Next one, please. Economic exploitive system for the keeping of cattle, the growing of barley, and the growing of wheat. And they recorded their cattle, which were clearly important to them. And you can see that these are patches of color. They have uh, shapes, horns that are different from one. And they are occasionally, and some of them, I don't believe there's one here, you can see them, they were being tended by, by men. Next one, please. <clears throat> These are really very spectacular, and this particular suite is from the uh, uh, from Why Not, uh, the cave paintings that are in some of the caves there, and Why Not. I believe that's my last slide. Could we have the the uh, lights, please? Thank you very much. Are there?
I don't know what's our time schedule. Do we have uh, any questions? Everybody or? had a question about that there. Just that last slide. Where did, where did you say he From why not? Um, <coughs> in the southwest corner of Egypt and the northwest corner of Sudan, they come together. There's a big mountain. And, and Libya also comes together right, you know, right down there. The Libyans have occupied it right now. Uh, but uh, in fact, some friends of mine were recently picked up by the Libyans and uh, uh, 100 miles inside Sudan. Yes, yes, they could have been trophies. I think they could well have been. However, they, you know, they they were arranged on an altar, and that was, that's uh, it may be, it may well be. Leaping at a at an explanation to say it's religious uh, indications. There are other signs. They had the first signs of religion. These bear cults. Um, we have the first intentional burials of people. Occurs during the Middle Paleolithic, which well, suggests. Pardon. The late Paleolithic. What date is that? The late Paleolithic, about forty thousand years ago. Well, our, we really owe the modern work to uh, Louis Leakey. Um, he is the, uh, you know, when I was a graduate student, everybody thought Louis Leakey was some uh, clown. I guess that's being kind. Um, and um, <coughs> and I, I think that was probably the world's, scientific world's perception of him as a, uh, but um, uh, he kept uh, things coming out of that cigar box of his. And uh, in reality, he kept going back there and going back and going back and finally kept found enough things. And also not just that, but the, the, uh, the world caught up with him. And the, the technology caught up with him so that, so that some of these discoveries that he, that he had been making could be, more, could be evaluated in a, in a more specific way. The, the, the atomic uh, era began. I guess that's the, he, you know, he, it's it's one of the great things that he lived long enough to see his his, you know, his early dreams vindicated. Oh yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I <coughs> I thought all of you would identify with the Britons who did that. And, and I was really, because everybody, I, I teased my wife, who's English, by, by telling her, you know, that, that when the rest of the world was, uh, uh, you know, an advanced state, well, they were running around painting themselves blue. And, and what I was really saying is when the Africans were an advanced state of food production, the people in the Levant were painting themselves blue. You see, I mean, they, they, they were still going to spend 10,000 years chasing rabbits before they got around to... I'm, I'm being, I'm giving a very complex story, a very simple kind of presentation. <laughs>